Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, can I start by saying that it's a, a huge honour for me to be invited by the International Tunnelling Association to deliver the Muir Wood uh, lecture. The, uh, uh, there was a small technology uh, problem going on as I'm speaking, but I think uh, in a few minutes you will see something, I hope, on the screen. Uh, what I would like to start by saying is that Alan Muir Wood uh, was somebody who I knew very well. He was a tremendous inspiration to all of us involved in tunneling and in geotechnical engineering. And he had a very strong uh, passion that there should be a close link between geotechnical engineering and uh, tunneling. And it is uh, something that always influenced me in the work that I I have been doing. Now, the, tunnel, the title of my lecture is Tunneling in Urban Areas and Effects on Infrastructure, Advances in Research and Practice. I'm going to speak um, in two parts. Firstly, the effects of tunneling on buildings uh, and some research advances. I'm going to describe centrifuge modelling and case histories, some field data of the performance of buildings, how do buildings actually perform when we tunnel beneath them, and I will be outlining a proposed new design method. And then the second part of the talk will be recent innovations in field monitoring, optical fibre measurements, wireless sensors, and some future developments for smart Tunneling. Now, the theme of my talk is about how buildings deform. And the real question is, does a building follow the same settlement trough as the ground itself, which requires it to be very flexible? How flexible is it? And I'm going to dis distinguish between buildings in the hogging zone, that's to the left of this point of inflection, and buildings in the sagging zone. And the crucial parameter is the deflection ratio, which is this amount delta H divided by this distance LH. That represents the curvature or differential settlement. And this is important because there are many ways of defining building damage, different increasing categories of damage, where we can plot the deflection ratio against the average horizontal strain in the building and depending on these values there are different increasing categories of damage to buildings. Now how do buildings modify the shape? At the, if we have a, tunnel, a building shown here and a tunnel here, a fully flexible building will have a modification factor of one and a fully rigid building a modification factor of zero. Firstly, if it's a greenfield case and the building is completely following the settlement trough, then the, the factor would be one and the deflection ratio would be as I have defined um, in the previous slides. But if the building has some inherent stiffness, then there will be a modification factor which will be the deflection ratio of the building divided by the deflection ratio of the green field situation. And if the building is completely rigid, then that factor would be M would be zero. The building would have zero deflection ratio. It would just tilt rigidly. Now, in Cambridge, we have been doing centrifuge modeling and that involves a very large 10 meter diameter centrifuge where we make models and we accelerate them to very high accelerations in order to match the stress level at full scale, in full scale tunnels. So work by a recent PhD student of mine, Rory Farrell, is shown here. This is a model 
uh, equipment about to be placed on the centrifuge. All of this weighs, uh, has a mass of about one tonne. Here is a model tunnel in the soil with a model structure shown here. And we can use, um, uh, we use digital photography to take photographs at very high speed and we can, as the tunnel volume loss is simulated and the structure deforms, we can measure in great accuracy what happens to the building and to the soil. So here, for example, is a settlement uh, for a green field case. This is for a case where there is uh, no building, just green field, and this is for 2% volume loss. And then if we do the same experiment with a flexible building, we get almost identical behavior to the green field case. But then if we have a building with some stiffness, we begin to see a different response. And then as we have a stiffer building, we get a progressively stiffer response and, and uh, a stiffer building still until we can see a pattern of increasing rigidity of buildings modifying the response to the tunneling. And this is very important when it comes to design when we have real buildings and real tunnels. So how can we define this relative stiffness? A relative stiffness is defined as the stiffness of the building, EI, divided by the stiffness of the soil uh, and the depth of the tunnel and some dimensions of the building. This is the way which has been proposed in the past by Francius and other workers. But there are new ways in which this can be defined which involve a simpler definition. EI of the building divided by the soil stiffness divided by the, the, the width of the building in the hogging zone for the green field equivalent settlement profile. So B hog in the case of the hogging zone, the cubed, B hog cubed uh, times L, which is the length parallel to the tunnel, and the same for the sagging. These are new definitions which simplify and uh, are, are much more appropriate for design, as I will show you. So here are some centrifuge model tests uh, undertaken by uh, Rory Farrell. And you can see what's plotted here is the modification factor, M. Remember, zero means very rigid behavior, and one means completely flexible behavior. And this is a plot of the relative building stiffness, the new definition, on a logarithmic scale. And you can see that all of the data fall within a relatively narrow envelope. And there are different symbols uh, the solid symbols for hogging and the open signals for sagging. Now, many finite element analyses have been undertaken by other researchers, and these two indicate similar trends plotted on the same scales, and they too fall within a relatively narrow envelope. So, just to recap here, a fully rigid response is where M is zero, which means that the building is tilting completely rigidly. And a fully flexible response is when M equals one, when the building is acting completely flexibly. But we can determine what value of M is appropriate depending on the relative building stiffness. There is potential, considerable potential, for reducing the need for protective measures. And now I'm going to show you some uh, a case history of a building response uh, of two buildings to a particular tunnel that illustrates this point. This is a case study in Italy uh, for a large uh, 12 meter diameter tunnel under, which goes under two buildings, this building 106 and this building 107. The tunnel was in stiff, silty clay uh, and Extensive protective measures were used. It's a 12 meter diameter tunnel supported with sprayed concrete, and there was a lot of jet grouting 
from the surface and also from within the tunnel. There was also compensation grouting, fore poling, face anchors and drains in the tunnel face. A lot of treatment in other words. This is a cross section uh, through the tunnel showing that tunnel 12 meter diameter about 17 meters below ground level. The uh, ground properties, the ground conditions, uh, the undrained shear strength at the level of the tunnel here varies between about 100 kPa and about 200 kPa and there were a lot of uh, tests to also establish the other ground properties. So in the first part of the tunnel, this part here, there was a lot of jet grouting undertaken from the ground surface in order to create a canopy above the tunnel. And then in the second part here, most of the jet grouting was undertaken from inside the tunnel, uh, creating a lot of uh, jet grouting here and also in the face of the tunnel. So this tunnel had a lot of jet grouting in order to, um, to try to protect the buildings. Monitoring instrumentation was extensive, so there were many arrays of instrumentation, but in particular between the buildings here, there was some green field instrumentation to see how the ground behaved between the buildings. But there were also uh, arrays on the building itself here and on the other two, two other arrays on the other building. So first of, the, first of all, the green field response. So we're looking at the response of an array between the buildings. And we're going to see as the tunnel approaches from the right, moving towards the left, we're going to plot the settlement uh, array here. And we'll see that the settlements conform to a Gaussian distribution as the tunnel moves across. And what we do observe is that by the time the tunnel had gone right through, that there were some very large settlements, almost 200 millimetres, with a volume loss of around 5%, most of which was caused by the jet grouting. But we have two buildings here of extremely different stiffness. We have building 106, which is a two-storey building, and we have building 107, which is a five-storey building, and building 107 uh, we estimate to be about 40 times stiffer than building 106. So we have the same tunnel going under two buildings of very different stiffness. So building 106, that's the, the two-story building, we're plotting here the settlement as the tunnel goes from right to left, and you'll see the settlement developing as the tunnel moves across and we end up with a settlement here which is pretty much like the green field shape. In contrast, on the right hand side we see building 107 and as the tunnel moves across you'll see a very different response. As the, building, as the tunnel progresses you see that the building is more or less tilting uniformly. Not quite uniformly but pretty much so. So just to compare these two buildings, we see building 106 responding relative fle relatively flexibly. That's building 106. And building 107 is pretty much tilting. So now what I'm going to do is to show some other buildings that we have also monitored in a similar way. And I'm going to uh, draw together five different buildings which have been very carefully monitored, uh, all uh, two of which are the ones I've just shown you in Italy, in Bologna, these two here. But the other ones are all, uh, three of the other ones are in London, a very different type of buildings. This is a reinforced concrete frame, modern building. This is a massive masonry building, uh, about more than 100 years old. 
This is a typical domestic house, masonry house, and these are shop houses in Singapore, a very famous kind of building in Singapore, and these uh, buildings here are the reinforced concrete frame buildings in Italy that I have just described. So these five buildings were all monitored extremely carefully uh, when the tunnelling was taking place beneath them. And plotting the modification factors, that's the factor that goes from zero to one, against this relative bending stiffness with the new definition that I've described, you can see that all of those buildings, all very different from very different countries, very different types of construction, they all fall reasonably narrowly between these same uh, lines here. So there is a, an important difference uh, changing the modification factor in this range here. And if we compare that same plot, that's the same plot over here, with the centrifuge model data from Cambridge and the finite element work that was done by other researchers, you can see that the field results are indeed very similar to the results that we have seen from centrifuge tests and from finite element analysis. That, that broadly speaking, if the, if the relative building stiffness is less than 10 to the minus 4, then the building will be fully flexible. But if the building, uh, relative building stiffness is greater than, than 1, then the building beh will behave in a fully rigid way. And if it's in between, well then the designers have to make that judgment. But we can now quantify with confidence how a building will behave when a tunnel goes beneath it. And this has implications for design, because this is the same plot that I showed earlier at the beginning. The deflection ratio, which, which represents the differential settlement, this is the horizontal strain. And if we just, for example, to use those two cases in Italy, if we assume the green field site uh, condition, we would predict a very high category of damage. If we also assume that the horizontal strain was as high as the green field case. But in fact, that flexible building 106 had a less horizontal strain, but still a large deflection ratio, but it brought it into a, a slightly lower category of damage. But most significantly, the rigid building, building 107, had zero deflection ratio and small horizontal strain, which meant that the building was hardly damaged at all. So, depending on the stiffness of the building, we may not need to worry about expensive protection measures. So in summary, the centrifuge modelling provides new insights into building response to tunnelling. It's consistent with field data of building performance. The relative building stiffness is a very important parameter. So stiff buildings experience much less differential settlement than flexible buildings. And in such cases, expensive protective measures will not be necessary. And in many cases, very small horizontal strain is induced in the buildings. So what this is all shown is that the new design approach that has been proposed, which takes account of the relative building stiffness, has been verified by centrifuge model tests and by field data of building performance. Now, in the next part of the lecture, I'm going to talk about optical fibre monitoring. This is a very exciting new development with enormous implications for tunneling. Fiber optic or optical fiber comes in many different types, many different uh, uh, kinds of fiber, but the one on the right, labeled A here, is the cheapest sort. This costs only about 20 cents, it's American money, 20 cents per meter. So it's very cheap. And there is a very important principle of distributed optical fiber sensing.
that if light is launched down the, the fibre, most of it, 99% of it, is transmitted. That's why optical fibre is used for that purpose. But a small amount is backscattered. And that backscattered, if we plot the power of the backscattered light against the wavelength of the backscattered light, we find there are various peaks. And there's a Raleigh peak and a Brillouin peak. And the difference between those two peaks is strain dependent. This means that we can, we can have optical fiber and we have a special piece of equipment here which puts light down the optical fiber and we can actually get the entire strain profile all the way continuously down the optical fiber. We can detect change of strain. This is called distributed strain sensing. We can get the average strain over a meter length every 20 centimeters of fiber. And we can have a very long range. We can do this over as, many, as much as five kilometers of optical fiber, even. As a high resolution, uh, we can resolve strains uh, down to about 30 micro strain. It's very low cost, the sensor itself. The, the fiber optic is very low cost. And it takes about between five and 25 minutes to process the measurements. And we can link and switch between different fibers. So here are some examples used for tunneling. In London, we had an eight and a half meter diameter masonry tunnel, old masonry tunnel, below which was going to be constructed a new tunnel, six and a half meters in diameter, only 3.6 meters below. This was rather complicated because there was a retaining wall actually founded on this masonry tunnel, which was supporting a canal. And the new tunnel, this one here, was going to be constructed beneath the old tunnel. So the old tunnel runs like that. And there was a lot of concern about the condition of this old masonry tunnel. So optical fiber, shown in yellow, was placed around and inside the tunnel like that. So that's the way the optical fiber was linked um, at, at, at uh, over a 60 meter length, various different loops attached all inside the tunnel and then connected up to a shaft to the, to the computers. So this shows the optical fiber, how it's actually been fixed. And the fixing details are shown here. And then the, the actual, what we would expect to happen is illustrated here. If you have an old tunnel, roughly circular, and you construct a new tunnel beneath it, the old tunnel will go into an egg shape like this. And if we plot the strain, and we plot the strain around on the inside, we would expect to see tensile strain on the west wall on the inside. We would expect to see compression over the crown, tension around the uh, inside on the other side. So we'd expect to see this kind of strain diagram. The tunnel was constructed. Um, the volume loss was about 1%. And what I'm going to show you now uh, is the, at these three different locations, five different locations, this is the tunnel, the new tunnel coming in, and we're plotting the strain at these five different locations. And I'm going to, the one to watch in particular is this change here, 516, when this tunnel will have reached 516, and I'll stop it at that point, and you'll see that the tensile strain is really quite high at that point. So now you can see as the tunnel over several weeks was constructed beneath the old tunnel, the optical fiber gives a continuous picture. So now I've just stopped it, and there you can see the new tunnel underneath Chainage 516. You can see the tensile strain is about 
which is quite high, and there was some small amount of cracking. But why this is so powerful is that this, this technology can allow a complete um, monitoring in real, almost real time uh, of the effect of a new tunnel on an existing uh, masonry tunnel and is measuring the strain in, in, uh, in a continuous way. And as the tunnel went past, uh, there was a little bit of reduction and actually by the time it had finished, the, uh, the, the strain had, by the time it had gone past, the strain here had reduced somewhat to less than the peak of 0.25%. But this was also, of course, monitored with conventional uh, technologies, and these were vector plots produced from theodolite surveying. And this is the strain against uh, distance, and the vector plots, the theodolite, when analyzed, produced these points here of strain, whereas the optical fiber produced this continuous line here. And you can see there's very good agreement between the optical fiber and the strain that was eventually deduced from the theodolite survey. The same technology has been used uh, relatively recently in Singapore, where there is a tremendous amount of exciting tunneling going on. And there was a particular problem for the Circle Line 3, where two tunnels were being constructed extremely close together for reasons of uh, complicated uh, foundation constraints. The tunnels were being constructed through uh, weathered granites, and the zones in which the uh, optical fiber monitoring was used is shown here. And the first tunnel that was constructed through what's known here as G5, which is a, a, a moderately weathered um, Complete, moderately to completely weathered granite, that caused a lot of ground movement. And so there was concern about what may happen. Uh, that, that was the one that caused a lot of ground movement. So when the second tunnel was constructed, there was a lot of concern as to what might happen to the first tunnel. And so what they did was to um, place some First of all, some GRP dowels in the ground between them. This spacing here is only uh, about one, one and a half meters. But they placed the optical fiber all the way around inside the tunnel to measure the strain response to this tunnel when the second tunnel was constructed. And here you can actually see the, the, the there is the optical fiber being fixed around the inside of the first tunnel with some good practical protection um, just so that the fibre didn't get kicked by the tunnel operatives. And again, like the previous example, this is the kind of, what we, kind of strain profile we would expect. If you have a first tunnel and then a second tunnel, you, we would expect it to develop an elliptical shape shown as in the red line here, which means we'd expect to see tension in the crown on the inside and compression uh, on the sides. And that's plotted like this. So tension, that's tensile strain, and these are compressive strain. And this is indeed the pattern that was seen. So here is a strain distribution that was measured. Um, by various different, uh, uh, various different changes. Uh, due, and the, if we assume a, an elliptical deformation, slightly tilted downwards, we would predict the purple line here for the strain distribution. Strain in the crown, tensile strain in the crown, compressive strain on the two sides. And you can see that the optical fiber was producing a distribution very similar to what was predicted. Now it turns out that the actual diameter change of the tunnel due to the second tunnel was only four millimeters. So the second tunnel was constructed in much, much uh, better conditions than the first tunnel. 
So in fact, the strains being measured here are really rather small, but you can see how powerful this optical fiber technology is. It's also being used to assess conditions of um, different completed tunnels. There is one tunnel at present in London Underground that's causing some problems. The, um, the uh, tunnel is a, uh, an expanded lining tunnel with a lot of segments, many segments, and there are signs of, of spalling and deterioration in the crown, also at the springings, and uh, there is cracking also evident. And there are ground conditions that are changing. This is causing some concern. It's an operating tunnel for London Underground. And so this optical fiber you can see uh, spanning across the joints here has been invaluable in monitoring the movement and the changes of strain taking place in this completed tunnel. So just in summary, this BOTDR fiber optic technology pro has provided valuable strain data for Thameslink masonry tunnel, that's that big tunnel, and for the Singapore close proximity tunnels. The continuous strain profile is a big advantage. It's low cost installation, and I believe it's a very promising new development for monitoring tunnels and indeed many other geotechnical applications. At Cambridge, we have used this optical fiber for reinforcement cages in diaphragm walls, in board piles, um, and my colleague, Professor Kenichi Soga, and I have been uh, using this for a, quite a number of practical applications. Now, The Economist, uh, the magazine The Economist, had an article recently um, called superstructures, about putting new sensor devices on all sorts of civil engineering applications. And this is a view of a wireless sensor being placed on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. But it's also possible to do this for tunnels. And wireless sensors are changing our lives in many ways. We're all familiar with wireless technology. There are now some exciting possibilities of using wireless technology for monitoring the performance of completed tunnels without having to use wires. And the sensors of different kinds can be placed in the tunnel which can measure strain, crack width, deformation, and they can beam their results to a central gateway and up into a mobile network. And I'm going to show you just some applications of that. Again, this is the same tunnel in London Underground. So there are a number of different arrays here where there are inclinometers shown in red. There are crack devices, crack measuring devices, LPDTs, shown in blue. And this is over a, over a distance of about 40 meters of a particular length of tunnel that was causing some concern. The inclinometer device is shown here. Um, and you can see that the, the biggest part of that device is the battery. The battery actually represents the biggest part of it. The actual the inclinometer board itself, the microcircuitry, is now very small. And as soon as we can reduce the size of batteries, then these, the size of these uh, wireless devices will reduce to even smaller than this. But this is the device with its antennae and that um, there is also a similar one which measures cracks. So here we now have a tunnel with these devices in it, crack meters and inclinometers. Um, and I'll just show that one again. There are the different devices. Uh, there's a gateway here, the crack meter, inclinometers all the way along, and they can actually measure and beam their data directly to the gateway. And this has got very, very uh, powerful and, and useful applications for measuring tunnel performance. We also are developing at Cambridge MEMS sensors. These are microelectronics 
So many of these devices here are strain gauges or crack meters, but power harvesting is a very exciting possibility. I mentioned batteries earlier on. It's possible now to envisage such devices in tunnels where the wind from the trains is sufficient to turn a tiny little turbine to generate the power needed for the sensor. So we may not even soon, we may not even need to have batteries. The Economist finished up um, in its very important article. It said, if a car can be made smart enough to spot when the oil is low or a brake light has failed, why not do the same for bridges, tunnels and buildings? And I believe that The Economist is absolutely right. There have been some recent developments in sensor technologies that provide huge opportunities for us, for the tunneling industry. There have been new insights into the response of buildings to ground movements caused by tunneling. The relative stiffness of the building is important. And the word relative, of course, means the stiffness of the building relative to the ground beneath it. A new design method has been uh, proposed for predicting the response of that building. And this is very important, I believe, because there will be a reduced need for protective measures. Compensation grouting and other such measures are expensive and they may not all be necessary. BOTDR fiber optic technology is a promising strain monitoring technique for tunneling and indeed for many other geotechnical applications. And finally, wireless sensors provide an exciting new opportunities for monitoring tunnel infrastructure throughout design life. We really have the concept now of smart tunnels. Thank you very much for your attention.